welcome Cornerstone. We are so glad that you are gathered with us. We're scattered in so many different places here in the Kansas City area as well as the country, but we are gathered together online and we have a purpose. And that purpose is to worship God for who he is and for what he's done. And we worship God today as the one who is our judge and he has judged us in Jesus Christ. And when we're in Christ, what that means is when he looks upon us, he sees the perfect righteousness of Jesus. And so as a result, we're free and we're forgiven and that changes everything for us. And so we want to celebrate and make much of him. And we get to do that together. If you are in the Kansas City area, we hope that you have defrosted. It has been cold. And so we hope that you've been able to stay warm over the last uh, week. And again, we're just delighted that we get to have this time together in worship. Well, a couple things that I want to remind you about. The first is this, our Eagle Lake Day Camp is coming up uh, this summer, and we have over 65 kids already signed up. We are super excited about this. We're praying for those kiddos already, and we're praying that God would bring even more um, over the next several months that they would register and be a part of this incredible opportunity this summer. But I want to put something in front of you. We are going to be in need of host homes to host the counselors that will be running this camp this summer. And that the camp begins July 19th and it goes all week long. And so we want you just to be thinking about that. Uh, if you would possibly be willing to host a few of those counselors. We'll also need some volunteers that week, and we're going to get more information to you in the coming weeks, but want just to give you that information so you can be thinking and praying about that. The next thing I want to tell you and remind you is this will be the last week to collect toilet paper for um, our missions drive during February. This all goes to City Union Mission. And here's the deal this Saturday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. at the at Cornerstone. You can uh, drop that off as a non-contact drop-off, and it's a great way for us to very, very practically serve our city and our community. And so again, that's coming up this Saturday. You can drop it off at our no-contact drop-off from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Well, we're continuing in this series, Bold Faith Part 2, and we're looking at this pas uh, passage in Romans 12, verse 19, and this is what the Apostle Paul writes. He says this, Beloved, Never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. This is a hard thing if you've ever been wronged. It's a hard thing to rest in the fact that God's the one who will accomplish his purposes. And vengeance is his. He's the one that does this for us. He's the one that brings about justice. And so it takes bold faith for us to step and to rest in that truth. And so Sheldon's going to be looking at this passage and teaching us what it means for us to step in bold faith and to trust the fact that vengeance is God's. It belongs to him. And we can rest in that. We can trust him for that. And so as we get ready to worship together, let's call one another into worship, remembering the one who is the Lord of glory, that God is the one who reigns over all things. He is the judge over the living and the dead. He is the one who will accomplish his purposes and his justice. And so let's call one another into worship. I'll begin and then we'll respond. It comes from Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory.
just sang, ponder anew what the Almighty can do. I love those lyrics, and those are good lyrics for us to consider as we prepare our hearts to hear the word preached today, especially as we learn what it means for us to not avenge ourselves, but rather leave that to God. It takes great faith for us to do that. It takes us to, to ponder anew what God can do because God is good, God is righteous, God is just. And we can leave that up to Him. We can rest in that. We can trust Him for that. And that's good news for us because it is hard when we've been wrong. If you've ever experienced that, you know that feeling. And what we do is we come together as the body of Christ, remembering who we are in Jesus. Here's what's true. There's a day coming when Jesus will come back and he will judge the living and the dead. And when he looks upon us, when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sinfulness. No, he sees the perfect, spotless righteousness of Jesus. And that changes everything for us, as we've said already. And so we want to continue in our time of worship by declaring our faith together, remembering, reminding one another what God has done for us, who he is. And so would you, with me, declare our faith as we read the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you pray with me? Our great Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our creator, that you are our maker, and you are the one who is our sustainer. You hold us in your hands, and you know the beginning from the end. You know each one of our days in fact, we know that you've ordained our days and you are the one who walks with us. And so we thank you and praise you for that. We ask now that you would open up our hearts to receive your word, especially as we look at what it means to leave vengeance to you, that we don't need to avenge ourselves when we've been wrong, but we can let that be in your hands. Father, we know that that requires great trust. And so we ask that you would produce within us, by the power of your Spirit, a greater trust, a greater rest in you and in your character. You are a God who is just and good and perfect and righteous. And we know that one day, when Jesus comes back, every tear will be wiped away and you will, make, you will set all things right. But until that day, help us to boldly walk in faith trusting you, trusting your purposes, trusting your will. And so now, lead us in this time. Make us more and more like Jesus. And we pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our study of Romans 12 is showing us that Jesus intended for the gospel to create a new society of Jesus followers right in the middle of our darkened and broken world. Jesus came to gather his own, to build his church from among the broken and transform them into a new creation. And he calls them to be salt and light, to be used to make the world a better place. 
That's the intent of salt. It was meant to prevent decay. And light was meant to brighten up the darkness around us. This is the purpose of the church. Here are people called out of the darkness and brought into the wonderful light and then sent right back to where we came from to be a reflection of God in the world. You see, we belong to the city of God while we live within the city of man. God's people become a little picture of heaven and earth. That's what the church is meant to do. But we must admit that we have often done a poor job and been accused of being more worldly than godly. Several years ago, a writer from Christianity Today interviewed the author Anne Rice, who was famous for her Vampire Chronicles series. Listen to what she said. She said, for those who care, and I understand if you don't, today I quit being a Christian. I'm out. I remain committed to Christ as always, but not to being Christian or being a part of Christianity. It's simply impossible for me to belong to this quarrelsome, hostile, disputatious, and deservedly infamous group. For 10 years I've tried, I've failed, and I'm an outsider. My conscience will allow nothing else. Well, that's a pretty strong statement about the state of Christianity from her perspective. I don't know what she experienced, but we need to hear her criticism. Instead of seeing the winsomeness of Christianity that turned the ancient Near East upside down, she saw people who were quarrelsome, hostile, disputatious, and they were infamous for it. She couldn't see Jesus in us. Well, in Romans 12, Paul is showing us how we can be more and more like Jesus. He said, let your love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, even outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord and rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation and be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality and bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. And never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. You see, God calls his church to be different from the world. And when we are most like Christ and most different from the world, we will display the winsomeness of Christ. We'll be divinely empowered to be an attractional force in the world. Martin Lloyd-Jones said the glory of the gospel is that when the church is absolutely different from the world, she invariably attracts it. Well, this morning we want to think about that when we think about vengeance and retaliation. We live in a revenge culture as well. Our culture says, I don't seek revenge, I just want to get even. Well, the power of vengeance is a lethal force. And when it captivates our heart, it will birth destruction. It will do whatever it can to even the score. What a difference it would make in our world if vengeance was overcome by forgiveness. I was pastoring a church in another state where there were two families that had experienced great tragedy. A mother was driving home one day with her infant child in a car seat in the back, and a drunk driver blew through a stop sign and hit them. The mother survived, but the newborn child died. The drunk driver was from a wealthy family, so he was dealt with lightly, and justice was never met. And this family was saddled with a heavy burden for the rest of their lives. There's not a day that goes by that they don't think about their child. And many years had passed when they shared their story with me. And it continued to bring tears to their eyes as they recounted that horrible day. And their pain was clearly evident as they expressed their loss and heartache. As I listened to their story, I was wondering what I would be like if I were in their shoes. A similar story had happened to another family in that same church. Their teenage son was killed at another intersection as he was driving home. And they too shared their story with me years after the fact. But the scene was similar. 
With tears in their eyes, they shared how the Lord had ministered to them and carried them along in the darkest time of their life. That was the testimony of both families. God had met them where they were and provided what they needed to carry on. God was still working in them and I was amazed by their perspectives. I've met a lot of people who've gone through great tragedy. I've seen the look of anger and hatred and bitterness. I've heard the voice of vengeance in the heart of man many times. I've seen it rage within others, but in these two families who lost their children, there was an overwhelming peace that was evident. There was a quietness in their soul, and I did not witness hatred or bitterness or vengeance. I witnessed instead a sustaining grace that was helping them get through each day and each year. They were determined to not allow vengeance and retaliation about the past to destroy their future. They were learning how to forgive the transgressions of others. Instead of vengeance, they were practicing forgiving love. And they were so different from those around them that they stood out in a way. They were like light in the darkness and salt in the middle of decay. The Word of God has much to say about vengeance. Romans 12, 19 says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. God says that there is never a circumstance in our life where we are to avenge ourselves. No matter what happens to you, and no matter how painful the hurt is, revenge is not the way in God's kingdom. Forgiveness is mightier than revenge. A selfish heart wants to take matters into their own hands. A sinful heart fantasizes about the opportunity to seek revenge. And so often we craft in our minds what we would like to see happen to the people that have hurt us. And we dream of the conversation that we would like to have where we slay them with our words. And when we take matters into our own hands, we dethrone God and we become king and live according to our own ways instead of God's way. Vengeance and retaliation are selfish acts. By default, we like to retaliate, but that makes Christianity and following Jesus so very different from the world is the divine gift of forgiveness. We have an idiom that we like to use it. It says, to err is human, to forgive is divine. It admits that forgiveness is rare. It's hard to find and it implies that forgiveness must have a divine origin. But Christians know where forgiveness comes from. Our God is a forgiving God, and if we belong to him, then we will also be forgiving. God's grace has come to us in an act of forgiveness. God allowed his son to pay the price for our sin. And when Jesus was hated, he expressed love. When others cursed him, he loved them back. And when he was put to death on the cross, he prayed for his enemies to be forgiven. When Jesus taught us to pray, he told us to forgive our debtors or to forgive those who transgress against us. And in Colossians 3.13, we are told to bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. There was an opportunity for Jesus to teach about forgiveness when he had dinner at the home of a Pharisee. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, He would have known who and what sort of woman this is and who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet, 
but she was has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. You see, the Pharisee was offended by the woman's sin. We don't know what her sin was, but she was apparently known in her community because of her sin. But when she heard that Jesus was there, she ran home and grabbed her bottle of ointment and came quickly to see Jesus. And she wept at his feet and anointed his feet with ointment and even kissed his feet. She was showing honor and gratitude to Jesus for what he had done for her, for forgiving her. She was expressing her love of, uh, to Jesus because she was a forgiven sinner. And the Pharisee was offended by the woman's sin, so Jesus took the opportunity to teach him about forgiveness. The woman in this story understood the gravity of her sin. She knew the sinfulness of her sin, but the Pharisee didn't. Her actions showed how much she loved Jesus. The Pharisee didn't even show Jesus the common courtesy you would give to a guest who would come to your home. And the woman anointed the feet of Jesus with expensive ointment. She understood the extent of her sin and expressed it with great and even lavish love toward the one who forgave her. The Pharisee couldn't see or acknowledge his sin. Well, she loved much because she was forgiven much. But the Pharisee loved very little because he couldn't even see he was a sinner and in need of forgiveness. And maybe that could be true of us when it comes to vengeance. When we see how much we are forgiven, we will forgive others well. And when we want to take matters into our own hands, it is because we haven't understood what Jesus has done for us. We're called to forgive and allow God to deal justly with those who hurt us. And God knows exactly how to handle the hurt that we do to one another. He's experienced it in the death of his own son. God's justice is always fair and balanced. And when we try to retaliate, we often are not proportionate. We can be too zealous and clouded by our sin, but that's never a problem for God. His justice is always fair. Let go of your vengeance and let God deal with it. Leave it to him. God has commanded us to do so. When you have been hurt, you have the opportunity to show the forgiving grace of God to a watching world. You have the opportunity to display God's grace and mercy that you've experienced. Several years ago, Matt was driving home after his 24-hour shift as a firefighter EMT. He had very little sleep that night and he fell asleep at the wheel. And he woke up to the crash of his car. He crashed head on into June Fitzgerald, who was seven months pregnant and had her 19 month old baby daughter in the back seat and her name was Faith. June and her unborn baby died instantly in the crash and only Faith survived. Eric was June's husband and he was a youth pastor at one of the nearby churches. Eric had preached on forgiveness many times and it had impacted his youth group. After the accident, one of the girls in his youth group spoke to him about the crash and she said she just couldn't get the driver of the car out of her mind. And Eric saw it as a teaching opportunity and he told her that she should pray for Matt because you forgive as you've been forgiven. It wasn't an option. If you have been forgiven, then you need to extend that forgiveness, he said. Well, Matt, the firefighter, had grown up in a Christian home, but was not really living for the Lord. And after the accident, he was in a pretty dark place. And one afternoon, he said to God, I surrender. And later, Matt was told that Eric had been praying for him and asking God to comfort him. Well, because of the legal issues, Matt and Eric were not allowed to talk to one another. But at the trial, Eric was was present for the sentencing. And Eric thought that this would be a wonderful opportunity for God to get the glory and for Christ to be lifted up. He asked the judge to show mercy and not send him to jail. Well, on the two year anniversary of the accident, they happened to walk into the store at the same time on the same day. And Matt had tears running down as he saw Eric there. And Eric just walked over and hugged him, and they both cried together. 
and Eric told Matt that he forgave him. And they began to talk for almost two hours, and a bond between them began. So they began to meet at, regularly at the Waffle House that was nearby, and they would pray together and share what the Lord was doing in their lives. Eric also helped Matt cope with the guilt that often consumed him and helped him forgive himself for what had happened. And through their relationship, both of their lives were changed forever. Eric said that when our little faith intersects with God's bigger story, God shows up big and God is faithful. They shared the power of forgiveness and restoration. And the story was picked up by the Today Show and shown all across the country. You can find the stories of vengeance every day, but the stories of forgiveness stand out so much more. Their story healed and blessed them, and they hoped their story would heal and bless others. That's what can happen when we let go of vengeance and we cling to God. We can forgive because we have been forgiven much. Forgiveness truly is divine, and the gospel medicine flows through our veins and enables us to forgive and to love. God's love toward us enables us to love those who have hurt us, and it's truly powerful. So cast aside your personal vendettas. Revenge will hurt you as much as you think it will hurt others. Instead, hold on to the sustaining grace of God. Well, Eric and Matt's story was so powerful that it attracted over 4 million views when it was posted on the internet. As Lloyd-Jones said, the glory of the gospel is that when the church is absolutely different from the world, she invariably attracts it. When you forgive others, you put God on display and it makes him irresistible. That's the way of God's kingdom. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for that good news that the gospel enables us to root out the vengeance that is in our heart, to deal with the hatred and the bitterness that can reside there. And because of Jesus in our life, we are able to see that dissipate and the love that we have received will be evident in the way that we treat one another. So Lord, when we have that desire to take matters into our own hands, when we have that desire to get even with those who have hurt us, would you remind us of Christ and how he has forgiven us and how we've been forgiven of our great sin and how he then enables us to love others in that way, to forgive instead of hurt. So Father, would you do that work in our midst this morning? May your spirit continue to shape us and mold us into your son. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I was lost when you found me here You pulled me close and you held me near And I'm a fool but still you love I'll be a fool for the King of love You gave me wings so I could fly You gave me a song To color the sky All I have Is all from you And all I want Is all of you Grace All these years you 
of carrying me You've been my eyes when I couldn't see And beauty grows in the driving rain Your oil and gladness in the times of pain And grace, your grace I'm nothing without you And grace, your grace Shines on me And grace Shines on me La 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 Your grace Your grace Shines on me I was lost when you found me here You pulled me close and you held me near Well, after we have finished, we have posted the link for the video story of Eric and Matt down below. Just click below to get to the comments section and it will be posted there. You have to access it through your computer or web browser in order to see it. Well, if we are honest, forgiveness seems impossible and vengeance seems so easy. This is why you need Christ. He's not something you add to your life. When Christ is yours, he becomes your life. Maybe there is someone in your life that you need to forgive, or maybe you need to ask someone to forgive you for what you have done. Forgiveness is more powerful than revenge. And maybe you need to write that letter or pick up that phone and seek to restore what is broken and heal what is hurt. This is exactly what Jesus does for us and empowers us to do. You have been loved much, so now you can forgive much. Today you can forgive instead of retaliate. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thanks for being with us today. We'll see you next week.